So assalamualaikum and good morning everyone. So I'll be talking about the use of anticoagulation in special circumstances and um, with a particular focus on venous thromboembolism. So this is what I'll be going through today. Um, I will go through the use of anticoagulants in venous thromboembolism, especially looking at secondary prevention of VTE, recurrent VTE whilst on anticoagulation, cancer-associated thrombosis, thrombocytopenia, as well as a short section on COVID-19 infection and anticoagulant use. So VTE is a major health issue and is globally the third most frequent cause of cardiovascular death behind myocardial infarction and stroke. The annual incidence rates in the Western population is around one per 1,000 people. And the rates in Asian populations were generally lower, one fifth lower than that reported in the Western population. However, these were studies from just a few Asian countries as shown in the table below. And the number is estimated to increase as there is increasing awareness and a growing elderly population across Asia. So this is a list of all the anticoagulants that are available at this point in time. We have the traditional anticoagulants, the unfractionated heparin, which has been around since the 1920s, the vitamin K antagonist, namely warfarin, since the 1940s. Hence, there's a lot of safety and efficacy data with the older anticoagulants. The newer anticoagulants with anoxaparin making its debut in the late 1990s, and uh, fondaparinox, um, an indirect factor 10 inhibitor in the 2000s, and we have now the DOAX, the direct all anticoagulants that are efficacious and have a lower bleeding rate than the vitamin K antagonists. And the DOAX, which came about in the mid 2000s, um, has really transformed the way we think about anticoagulants and how we give it to patients. I have derived most of my talk from these guidelines, the ACCP, the ESC guidelines, the updated NICE 2020 guidelines as well as the ASH 2020 guidelines on VTE. So, so for those of you who are interested, you can check these guidelines out. So I'll start with the case. So Mr. Tan is a 56-year-old gentleman with no known medical illness. He was diagnosed with an unprovoked pulmonary embolism and has now come up to three months of uninterrupted treatment with a Pixaban 5 mg BD. So we are looking at answering the question of whether Mr. Tan requires extended treatment to prevent a recurrence of VTE, and that is what secondary prevention of VTE is all about. I would like to draw your attention to this diagram from the ASH 2020 guidelines, which sums up clearly the distinct clinical phases of VTE. We have the initial management phase, the first 5 to 21 days following diagnosis of new VTE whereby anticoagulation is initiated. We have the primary treatment phase, which continues anticoagulant therapy for three to six months and represents the minimal duration of treatment for VTE. Patients who go on to secondary prevention will most likely require indefinite anticoagulation. So Mr. Tan has come to the important decision point shown here to continue or to stop anticoagulation. So what are the factors that you should be thinking about when you see such a patient? So these factors are important as they influence the duration of anticoagulation. You will need to weigh the risk of recurrent thrombosis with the bleeding risk. And finally, not to forget patient's preference as this determines compliance to the drugs. When estimating VT recurrence, it is important to pay attention to risk factors at initial thrombotic event. And this is nicely illustrated in the ISTH diagram above. VTE may be unprovoked or provoked by major, minor, or persistent risk factors. Management of cases at the ends of the spectrum is quite straightforward. For major provoked VTE, it's a limited duration of anticoagulation for at least three months, three to six months, whereby if you have a persistent provoking risk factor, the most common is active cancer. You continue anticoagulants for as long as the patient has active cancer and is on undergoing treatment. Now, the real headache, comes when uh, a patient lands in the middle with unprovoked VTE and even minor transient risk factors as these 
there are clinical equipoise with regards to how to manage patients um, with unprovoked VTE. So if you've had an unprovoked event, your risk of recurrence is very high. This meta-analysis, which was published in 2019, involving over 7,000 patients, looked at the rate of a first recurrent VTE after discontinuation of anticoagulant treatment in patients with a first episode of unprovoked VTE. The cumulative incidence for recurrent VTE showed an increasing trend from 16% at 2 years, 25% at 5 years, and 36% at 10 years. Recurrence is also three times more common in men than in women in unprovoked VTE, and this has been consistently reported in several studies. One of the recurrent VTE risk stratification models that have been validated and can be used is the HERDU-02 score. So in a cohort study of over 600 patients with unprovoked VTE, it was found that men have a 14% risk of VTE if they are off anticoagulants, and women have a similar risk if they have two or more risk factors that are shown here on the table. Um, so that's why if you use this risk stratification score, for men, you will continue anticoagulant therapy. And for women, you apply this score. And if they score more than two or more points, then their risk of uh, recurrent VT is the same as the, as the men. And so you would continue um, anticoagulant indefinitely. Now we look at the bleeding risk, and that is really the most important complication for any anticoagulants. And this remains so even with the news of newer anticoagulants. However, unfortunately, there are no such dynamic bleeding assessment tools that you can use to ascertain the bleeding risk at the three-month period. Over here, they use um, a more than 3% um, bleeding risk per year to deem a patient as high bleeding risk. And really, this is a clinical impression of patients with two or more of predisposing factors for bleeding. So if the patient has a high bleeding risk and unprovoked VTE, um, you would stop anticoagulants and take a look at whether you can rectify the bleeding risk and modify the patient back into a non-high bleeding risk um, uh, category and um, with a high non-high bleeding risk and unprovoked VTE, you would actually continue anticoagulants. I would also um, investigate for secondary causes of VTE as unprovoked VTE is really a diagnosis of exclusion. So at the three-month period, I would perform a thorough medical history and physical examination and perform baseline blood such as full blood count which could in a way um, point towards if there's thrombocytosis or polycythemia, you'd be thinking of a myeloproliferative neoplasm. If there's anemia and hemolysis, a paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. If there's any evidence of anemia, that would be a, a sign of uh, an, uh, an acute bleed and you would need to rectify that. So full blood count is quite helpful. Baseline renal function tests and liver function tests as well as a limited um, cancer screen uh, with a chest x-ray, if warranted. Um, I would like to point out that a thrombophilia screen is not indicated um, at this point in time, and um, um, it would not really change um, our management of the patient in the first place, and there's not much data supporting this practice. However, the exception would be for those planning to stop anticoagulation and have a low bleeding risk. So you want to have a discussion of why they need to continue anticoagulants. So you can, in a way, go down the route of performing a thrombophilia screen, as well as those suspected to have APLS as a um, this would influence which anticoagulants we'll be using for the patient. As um, I'm sure you are, most of you are well aware that in high-risk APLS, um, the use of DOEX have actually increased the risk of an arterial thrombotic event. So it is now recommended that warfarin is used instead for long-term anticoagulation in this group of patients. So this is reflected in most guidelines recommending indefinite duration of anticoagulation for unprovoked VTE, with the ACCP clearly stating that one should take into account the bleeding risk as well. 
So this table is a summary of the oral anticoagulants that can be used in the treatment of VTE in primary and secondary prevention phase. And if you take a look closely at Pixaban and Rivroxaban, you might note that the dose of these OX are lower than your usual standard dose. And this is really due to two trials that looked at low dose OX that really changed how we treat patients who require long-term anticoagulation. So the Amplify Extent and the Einstein Choice both looked at um, a Pixaban of two doses versus placebo, and the Einstein Choice looked at two different doses of Rivoxaban versus aspirin. Otherwise, they are pretty similar in characteristics, um, even um, the primary outcomes were similar, both looked at recurrent VTE as well as major bleeding, and both demonstrated significant reductions in VTE recurrences without a significant increase in the bleeding rate. And it is quite reassuring to note that the bleeding rate between low dose rivoxaban and aspirin is similar. So the latest guidelines, especially those from 2019 and above, have now taken note of the results of the two studies and recommend giving low dose to X in those requiring extended anticoagulation. Unfortunately, after two years on Apixaba, Mr. Tan presented to ED with a one-week onset of right lower limb swelling and ultrasound Doppler revealed extensive proximal deep vein thrombosis. Ah, Prior to that, sorry, prior to that, he has decided to continue indefinitely with Apixaban and has switched to low dose of 2.5 mg VD after the initial six months of 5 mg VD. And like I mentioned earlier, um, after two years on Apixaban, he um, presented with a right lower limb swelling and it was revealed that he had an extensive proximal deep vein thrombosis. So, um, Current anticoagulants are really good at reducing the risk of recurrent VTE whilst the patient remains on it. Um, therefore, recurrent VTE is an unusual event that a search for the cause is usually warranted. So these are the common causes for recurrent VTE. The most important cause would be malignancy, um, other pondopathy, Prothrombotic disorders include um, autoimmune conditions like antiphospholipid syndrome, certain vasculitis like Bashett's disease, um, hematological conditions like perhaps seasonal nocturnal hemoglobinuria and myoproliferative neoplasm. Also, it'd be important to check whether the patient is pregnant, if um, the patient is a lady of childbearing age, and also if you have um, some vascular abnormalities. Um, that predispose the patient to chronic obstruction of venous flow. This can also cause recurrences whilst the patient is on anticoagulation. You might be thinking, hang on, what about inherited thrombophilia? Well, I have included it, but as you can see here, it's in very small font, and I will state my reasons for it in the next few slides. So these next few slides are actually modified from Dr. Hana, our brilliant hematopathologist, pathologist. She um, had a talk on this um, a few months back. So if you ever wonder why your test for thrombophilia scheme was rejected, you can give her a call. Right. So um, this is a list of all the um, causes of um, on thrombophilic conditions, um, the inherited ones and the acquired ones. And the ones in big fonts are what I would deem as strong thrombophilias. So um, this, having this condition would actually push the patient into a higher risk of recurrent thrombosis. But with inherited um, thrombophilias, you must take into consideration that the clinical phenotype actually varies with the different um, types of inherited thrombophilias. Um, before we go on to what to test for, uh, most importantly, I would like to draw your attention to the right side of the screen where we have uh, prevalent studies of all these inherited thrombophilias. And um, as you can see, um, although these prevalent studies are done in the Western countries, um, it really is very rare. Um, I do not have um, the data on prevalence in Asian countries. So, um, Please bear in mind um, how rare these conditions are before you actually order a thrombophilia screen. So, um, for the more um, for the common 
um, inherited thrombophilia conditions like factor V Leiden and prothrombin gene mutation, usually we would proceed with a genetic analysis, polymerase chain reactions. For the more classic um, thrombophilic conditions, the protein C, protein S, and antithrombin deficiencies, you would normally need to order an activity assay. And for um, APLS, you would um, require um, a lupus anticoagulant, at least two clotting-based tests. Um, over here at UM, we perform the DRVVT as well as its leaker clotting time, an anti-cardiolipin antibody, and also a beta-2 glycoprotein-1 antibody, which we do not have here. So um, also another thing to bear in mind is the cost of these tests. So in UM, if you were to incorporate all of these, and bear in mind, um, uh, these are not, the thrombophilia study does not include um, genetic tests for factor V Leiden and prothrombin gene mutation. So with all these activity assays and a full uh, APLS screen, it would come up to at least 380 ringgit for the patient. So uh, these set of criteria should be met before considering a thrombophilia screen. I won't go through them in detail, but um, suffice to say that for inherited thrombophilias, Dr. Hana will only perform the thrombophilia screen if you have an unprovoked thrombotic episode and a positive family history and the patient has planned to stop med uh, the anticoagulant. As for those who plan to continue, there's really no point in performing the thrombophilia screen, as well as for those with provoked VTE, because um, extended treatment is really not indicated in these patients. So correct timing of the test is essential as well to come to a diagnosis of these rare conditions. And this British paper explains clearly the clinical issues when it comes to testing. And as you can see here, you do not perform thrombophilia testing at the time of VTE diagnosis. That means at the time of acute thrombosis or during the initial three-month course of anticoagulant therapy, as this does not change management. However, if you really do want to proceed with a thrombophilia screen, um, you can proceed with this two-stage testing approach, which is quite reasonable. The test that you can do while the patient is on anticoagulant would be a genotype-based test, would be the factor V Leiden and the prothrombin gene mutation, and those involving antibody titers, the anticardiolipin antibodies and beta-2 glycoprotein-1 antibodies. Um, the remaining tests are influenced by the presence of acute thrombosis or anticoagulant therapy. Therefore, it is best to defer the test until at least completion of the primary treatment phase, which is a minimum of three months of anticoagulation. So going back to Mr. Tan, um, if you see a patient with current VTE whilst on anticoagulation, you would really need to assess for treatment failure look for reasons why the anticoagulant might have failed. Is there a lack of adherence to the um, anticoagulant? Um, is there any evidence of poor GI absorption? Um, any drug-drug interactions? Any possible interruption for procedures? And also, at this point in time, you would investigate for secondary causes with um, a more extensive screening um, for occult malignancy, if required, from your um, thorough um, medical history as well as physical examination and also for the other secondary causes that I've mentioned earlier. So in patients um, confirmed to have a new event, the data is limited on how to approach management of these patients. And this approach is based on retrospective data and case series. So you would need to make every effort to retrieve old imaging of the previous VT and compare it to the new event. So if this indeed is a recurrent event, if the patient is on full intensity oral agent, a warfarin with therapeutic INR or DOAC, or a low intermediate dose low molecular weight heparin, you would switch the patient to full dose weight-based low molecular weight heparin or fondaparinox weight-based dose. If the patient is already on full dose weight-based low molecular weight heparin, you should dose escalate um, the low molecular weight heparin 220 to 125% um, of the previous uh, dose. And if this is done and yet the patient still has a recurrent VTE, um, you would consider addition of antiplatelet agents 
or a second anticoagulant with a distinct mechanism of action. All this while, please treat the underlying cause if there's a secondary cause for the recurrent VTE. There are currently no studies on direct dose adjustments, um, whether to give a higher dose for those recurrent VTE, so I would not recommend doing that at this point in time. So upon further history taking and examination, Mr. Tan has been having constitutional symptoms and noticed a lump in his right groin area for the past three months. On examination, he has palpable lymphadenopathy and the biggest would be at the inguinal um, area with the biggest at the right side, measuring three by four centimeters. Rivoxaban was stopped and noxaparin therapeutic dose was initiated instead and a lymph node biopsy revealed diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So there remain certain subgroups in which anticoagulant use is not as straightforward, and this is so in patients with cancer-associated thrombosis. So before we move on, it's probably a good uh, idea to um, probably just know the incidence of the incidence of the disease we are discussing and to recognize the importance of treating cancer-associated thrombosis. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we in a general population is one in 1,000 um, uh, people. And if you have a diagnosis of cancer, this puts you in a hypercoagulable state. And this is associated with an estimated increase in the risk of VTE four to seven times. And this brings the annual incidence of VTE to approximately one in 200 in the population of cancer patients. The um, clinical guidelines for cancer-associated thrombosis is different from the general VTE guidelines. So my uh, next few slides are derived mostly from these clinical uh, gui guidelines. And I urge those of you who are interested to read more um, you can do so um, by looking at these guidelines. So for the past 20 years, no molecular weight heparin has been recommended as first line based on superior efficacy demonstrated across randomized controlled trials. And um, this showed a 42% reduction in the risk of recurrent VTE without a significant increase in the risk of major bleeding. Um, and this brings about an important question whether DOAX can be used in the treatment of cancer associated associated thrombosis. There have actually been four randomized control trials, but I'm only going to put the three that are pretty similar. We have the Hokusai VTE trial that looked at edoxaban versus low molecular weight heparin, SELECT-D, which looked at rivoxaban versus um, low molecular weight heparin, and Caravaggio, which looked at apixaban. And um, like I mentioned earlier, all three are pretty similar in terms of um, the trial design, uh, number of patients, inclusion criteria, as well as the primary outcome, which they looked at recurrent VTE and major bleeding. So quickly going through the three trials, um, looking at DOAX in cancer-associated thrombosis, there's a reduction in VTE recurrence in all three trials, um, slightly higher rates of major bleeding in DOAX in two out of the three trials, the Hokusai VT and SELECT-D, and most of these major bleeding sites are gastrointestinal and genital urinary. However, the Caravaggio trial actually showed similar bleeding rates between apixaban and deltaparin. Um, and... Um, Low molecular weight heparin really remains the gold standard for at least the six months of initial treatment of uh, cancer-associated thrombosis. Guidelines have not incorporated the use of DOAX in the treatment of cancer-associated thrombosis. And um, as you can see here in the ITAC, ESCO, and NCCN guidelines, there is no preference over one particular DOAX over the other. And there is actually caution for use of these anticoagulants for those who have a high risk of gastrointestinal or genital urinary bleeding. So um, going back to Mr. Tan, he underwent three cycles of chemotherapy. His interim CT scan showed resolution of his lymph nodes. There was no residual swelling of his right lower limb, and he's been taking enoxaparin for 10 weeks now. And after a lengthy discussion, he has decided to switch back to a pizza bun. Five milligrams BD remained on the pizza bun until he achieved complete remission six months later. So let's um, leave Mr. Tan. I think he has quite a lot to uh, deal with. Um, so we looked at um, I want to talk briefly about thrombocytopenia anticoagulation as this is 
quite commonly um, encountered as a referral case from other units. Now, there are many, many causes of thrombocytopenia. The most common one would be encountered in malignancy through um, drugs, chemotherapy used um, to patients who are going to uh, stem cell transplants, radiation, or also thrombocytopenia and, and um, thrombotic tendencies can be seen in autoimmune conditions like SLE and APLS, um, ITP, Patients with sepsis and also cirrhosis and not to forget hematological conditions. So um, this was taken from a paper on patients with cancer associated thrombosis because like I mentioned earlier, there are um, uh, quite a number of patients with thrombocytopenia and thrombosis in this group of uh, cohort of patients. So if the platelet is um, more than 50,000, um, you would actually... Um, continue standard dose DOEX or um, weight-based full dose of low molecular weight heparin. However, if the platelet really is less than 50,000 and the patient can receive platelet transfusions to keep it above 50, then you would uh, consider transfusing platelets. And um, with that, you can continue using standard dose DOEX or standard dose um, low molecular weight heparin. If the patient cannot receive platelet transfusion and um, and there is not a high risk of clot propagation, which means whether uh, this is a proximal um, thrombotic um, event, then you can consider observation without anticoagulation. If there is a high risk of clot propagation and patients really need to be on anticoagulant um, for low molecular weight heparin, um, the lowest threshold really is 20,000. So for platelets between 20,000 to 50,000, you consider low dose, which is the um, prophylactic dose of low molecular weight heparin or intermediate dose, which is 50% of the standard therapy dose. And you would withhold anti -platelet ther um, anticoagulant therapy if the platelet is less than 20,000. For Idopsaban, the Hokusai VTE study actually recruited patients up to a platelet of 30,000 and used the standard dose of um, Idopsaban. For Rivaroxaban, um, the Select D trial actually um, recruited patients of platelet thresholds above 50,000. So um, this number of 25,000 to 50,000 is really from a non-randomized control trial looked at elderly patients who uh, received uh, 10 milligrams BD and 50 milligrams daily of Rivaroxaban, and they did all right, but it's a non-randomized control trial. For Apixaban, the Caravaggio trial actually recruited patients with a platelet count of more than 50,000. So um, actually with this um, uh, dose strategy, you can apply this for patients with high bleeding risk as well, um, especially looking at low molecular weight heparin, you can apply low or intermediate um, dose of uh, uh, low molecular weight heparin. So um, consensus guidelines from these um, uh, major cancer-associated thrombosis guidelines recommend full intensity anticoagulation patients with platelet count of more than 50,000. Although the ESCO and NCCN um, actually um, recommended um, uh, with caution a lower uh, platelet threshold um, in, um, in Malaysia, I would um, assume that um, a, a platelet count of more than 50,000 would be best as uh, we don't really have um, readily available um, reversal agents. So a platelet count of 50,000 would be best uh, for the patients. So quickly, quickly going through COVID-19 infection and anticoagulant therapy as I had this, I had this talk previously and I was inundated with questions about anticoagulant therapy in this cohort of patients. So um, as you can see at this point in time, there are many, many um, guidelines with regards to this complication, this particular complication of COVID-19 infection. And um, there will be more um, data to come as there are so many randomized controlled trials of antithrombotic therapy in patients with COVID-19. So I'm not going to go through this. Um, I'm sure you're all well aware of the um, pathophysiology behind um, hypercoagulability in COVID-19 infections. So this is a meta-analysis that showed um, 
that the risk of VTE is increased overall in patients with COVID-19. The pool incidence was 17% from this meta-analysis. And those with clinically severe disease requiring critical care or ICU care are at highest risk. So um, for thromboprophylaxis, there's really not much uh, difference from the standard uh, thromboprophylaxis guidelines. Um, all guidelines actually recommend standard dose anticoagulant thromboprophylaxis um, with the BTS guideline actually suggesting uh, to consider intermediate dose low molecular weight heparin for patients in critical care. And the use of DREX is really discouraged due to the high risk of rapid deterioration in this group of patients. Um, next would be the treatment of COVID-19 um, uh, infection patients with uh, VTE. Um, and all the guidelines are pretty much um, united in saying that for acutely ill and critically ill patients, they would prefer parenteral anticoagulation. And upon discharge, DOEX can be used. Although the ACCP did mention that initial oral anticoagulation can be used for those without any drug-to-drug -drug interactions. And there is no preference over any uh, uh, different mo low molecular weight heparin or um, DOEX to be used in this patient. Um, so in summary, low-dose DOEX are just as efficacious and is associated with a lower bleeding rate uh, for use as long-term um, anticoagulation. Um, low molecular weight heparin and DOEX can be used in cancer-associated thrombosis. There are no studies um, in dose-adjusted DOEX in patients with current thrombosis, high bleeding risk, and thrombocytopenia. So when in doubt, it's best to switch to low molecular weight heparin. And low molecular weight heparin is really the anticoagulant of choice for inpatient thromboprophylaxis and treatment of acute and critically ill COVID-19 patients. And with that, I thank you. And I'm really sorry for all the inconvenience caused earlier. Okay, good morning, everybody. Sorry for the, the slight delay. Um, I'm from the Medical Education Research and Development Unit. This morning, uh, I'm very pleased to have um, Dr. Satria Nor Shaban from Lecturio to present their solution to us. So just a quick uh, background on how they came into uh, UM. Last year, when we had COVID uh, declared and MCO was um, implemented, the students were all sent back to, um, to their homes. And what we then did was we actually were trying very hard to continue the delivery of the uh, undergraduate medical program. And um, we were trying to get our lectures done online, and it was not really quick enough. At that time, um, Taimo from uh, Lecturio came and offered us a solution, which um, actually had lectures um, and a quiz bank, and um, he made that available for us to use while we were preparing our own solution. In the meantime, the faculty decided to subscribe to this solution, and we've had it in place since September of this, of, um, sorry, since September of last year. But we noticed that the uptake has not been um, as good as we would like to uh, have it, probably because the onboarding uh, was, you know, lagging and we didn't have sufficient onboarding. Today, um, Dr. Satria will present to you uh, what are all the different um, possibilities that we as academic staff uh, uh, can provide to the students so that they are, this resource becomes more useful for the learning of, of our medical students. So without uh, further ado, can I invite Dr. Satria to present on the lecturial solution? Yes. Um, thank you so much, Prof. Jamuna, and thank you so much um, to the University of Malaya for the welcome um, and for providing us with the time to speak here. My name is Satria. I'm a, a physician from Indonesia, and I'm currently working with Lecturio as a consultant for them um, in, in learning, uh, learning science and student partnerships in, in the Asian region. So I'm just going to go ahead and start sharing my screen now. I was under the impression that this was going to be an event for your 
students. So do I have to, uh, so do I um, readjust this for the educators side um, based on Prof. Jamuna's introduction just now? I'd just like to confirm that as well. I think we will have uh, mainly academics, but we will also have some students who may have joined the presentation. I see. All right, then I'll um, read just a bit um, and focus also on the academics, um, uh, on the staff focused functionalities of Lecturio. But I think generally it's the same. Um, you know, the purpose of Lecturio is to support students in getting ahead in medical school and also to support educators in teaching um, you know, better and in a, in, a, in a simpler way, especially during these pandemic times when distributed and distance learning becomes the focus as opposed to in-person teaching. Um, so as I mentioned, this is uh, my name. Um, and I'd just like to play a one minute message from our CEO, uh, who is um, very apologetic that he's not going to be able to make it because of the time differences. So I'm just gonna go and play that. Dear University of Malaya students, this is Stefan Wisbauer, co-CEO of Lecturio. I just want to welcome you um, wholeheartedly to today's training session. Uh, one of our missions is to bring more learning science into the education process. And um, the goal of doing this is making you all better doctors in the long term. You know, traditional teaching is often to an assessment point. You do lots of cramming and then lots of forgetting right after you've probably been through this in your life. And we all have a few times. And with what my colleague Satria is going to show you today, um, really working with that kind of logic, you know, has the chance to um, lead to much better long term mastery of the subject matter. So we wish you uh, fun and some hopefully some interesting insights in the training. And um, the only reason we have such an exciting system is because many students like yourselves and educators with passion for the subject keep on nudging us and keep on giving us critical feedback. So we encourage you to do the same. And so don't be shy to share your ideas and feedback. And good luck with your session today. Thank you. and Bye bye. Right. Um... And I'm just going to go ahead and jump through today's agenda. We have four main things that I wanted to deliver. Um, keep in mind, though, I'm really sorry that I was building this presentation with students in mind. Um, I will readjust um, to incorporate um, staff-oriented content, as I've mentioned, um, but some would be a bit student-oriented, as I mentioned. So we're going to through, run through some lecture um, background and key ideas. Um, I'm going to share some numbers with lecture that makes it relevant um, as a teaching tool. Um, I'm going to show um, several tricks on why and how Lecturio can be encouraged in, um, in, in daily um, ped pedagogy and um, quick lecture run through to show you how to practically use it in your daily learning and teaching. So some backgrounds and key ideas. Um, Lecturio combines um, our content with the latest state-of-the-art learning science to make the most of the study sessions. We make sure all our slides have correct proportions in regards to text and images. We provide supporting um, teaching tools on the side of the video to make sure that everything is um, you know, tactile or as tactile as they can be. We provide um, clinical case question banks with direct feedback that allows students to understand where they're getting things wrong and where they're getting things right. And we provide also space retrieval um, questions that pop up at the end of each of our videos, which is applicable as well to all videos that the UM staff uploads to our platform, as long as you input the questions when you upload it. Um, we are focused on being adaptable and user-friendly. Um, the platform is as scalable and as adaptable as you, as you need it to be. You can assign as many content as you want, the whole course of 24 hours if you'd like, a whole course of five hours if you'd like, or as, as, as little as a course of five minutes, if that is what you require for your students. Um, you know, it is also designed to help your students become more self-directed um, because we incorporate a comprehensive monitoring assessment tools, both to be used by the students and also by the teachers. But I, I will share in a little while how this can happen. Um, and, you know, it, it allows you as educators also to practice the flipped classroom approach more easily without having to prepare too many things from your side and, um, you know, attaching 
um, advanced video lectures and advanced reading materials before class um, have never been easier. Um, some numbers that is that are that would be relevant or interesting for you to know is that we have around six thousand five hundred hours of video. No, not six hundred five thousand hours, but six six thousand five hundred videos in our platform that spans the entire medical curriculum. It includes everything from preclinical to clinical content, as well as physical examination content, which I think is um, very relevant right now um, during this pandemic times. Um, we have more than 400 3D model enhancement that are attached to our anatomy videos. Um, we have more than 20,000 recall questions that pop up at the end of each of our videos and allow students to um, assess their understanding of the concept as well as retrieve them when the time comes. Um, around 1,000 concept cards, which are articles, um, including links, graphics, and illustrations that help students understand in a different format than our videos and um, more than 4,500 clinical case questions spanning, again, preclinical and clinical content, along with um, direct feedback in the form of um, you know, assessment of where they're getting things right and where they're getting things wrong. Um, you know, we have more than 1 million active users worldwide and more than 50 uh, global student partner organizations working with us um, and a combined experience amongst our teachers in our platform of 200 years. And these teachers come from all over the world and they bring um, a wealth of experience in their, in, in their own fields to our platform and to our members. Um, so I want to start with a story about why Lecturio and by, and by extension learning science is important in learning and teaching. Um, you know, we have, we have a, you know, a model student here, Lexi, and Lexi has been investing all her time in studying, but unfortunately has been finding that she's not doing well in her exams. Um, you know, since, uh, since she has been giving um, more time. She cannot give more time because she's trying her best and she's giving her all in studying. She considered how she can make her studies more effective. And she started looking for research-based learning platforms. Um, she found Lecturio and was able to mix different learning strategies directly inside the platform, incorporating cognitive science-based techniques into her, uh, into her learning. Um, it felt counterintuitive at first because it's an additional source. It requires more time to implement at the beginning, um, and it feels like you're slowing down learning because you're not, you know, you're not just going to the point and not just memorizing the things that you need to pass an exam. But she started the, the process and saw great, great results. And I think this is a great, um, you know, a great story to illustrate how learning science may not yield results from the get-go, but if the process is trusted and if it is implemented consistently. Um, you know, research has shown um, unequivocally that it is um, it is good for students and educators to implement it deeply inside their teaching. <clears throat> so how to apply Lecturio daily? Before I start my demo, um, it's going to be a very quick demo. I wanted to share three main things that, um, and including the evidence behind it, that I think people should try implementing with Lecturio. Um, so the learning science strategies that we incorporate or we make easy for people to apply through our platform include dual coding, spacing, interleaving, concrete examples, elaboration, as well as recall and retrieval. And these act at different stages of memory process creation, um, including encoding, storage, and retrieval. Um, and, you know, we aim to help students um, have better metacognition. I mean, it's essentially thinking about one's thinking, thinking about how we plan, monitor, and evaluate our learning. And good students often have good metacognition skills, although you know a causal relationship has not been established between the two. Uh, and this is very important. You know, knowing about how you're learning, knowing what, where you are in your um, learning is important to learn better as students, to teach better as educators or peer educators in the care of in the case of students, and to make learning more efficient and effective. Um, and you know, the met metacognition yields what we call the Dunning-Kruger effect, where at first they are, um, students would often be in the, uh, on the peak of Mount Stupid, for lack of a better word. Um, this would be students at the beginning of their studies who are full of confidence and happy that they've learned um, medicine for the first time in their lives. Um, as they go uh, through their uh, medical training, they will then see the, the depth and the breadth of knowledge that they need 
to accumulate in order for them to become competent physicians and they enter the valley of despair. Um, and eventually, as they again go forward in their training, they enter the slope of enlightenment and the plateau of sustainability, which is when you know your competence and your confidence align. And this comes um, and this is this comes and this is supported by a good metacognitive skills and an understanding of where they are at in their education at any given point in time. Um, the Metacognition Insider platform is, as I've mentioned, supported by our robust performance analysis features. For students, this allows them to understand where they're getting things wrong with the question bank, with the video questions that we, sub we, we provide at the end of each of our lectures. And for teachers, it comes in the form of you know, graphical representation and the data center that's, that allows you to see how much time students are spending on the platform, how much time students are spending on each content, each type of content, and use these data as you like to adjust your subsequent lessons to address the things that students are not getting right or that students are struggling with. Um, and so that's metacognition. Uh, the second thing that, um, that usually that I would encourage people to try out with Lecturo is the concept of space retrieval. Um, you know, which is periodically retrieving knowledge on a certain topic at certain intervals. This is often used interchangeably with space repetition, distributed practice, etc. Um, it combines the testing effect, which is the postulation that um, knowledge is learned and retained better if they are tested on it, um, or with uh, with periodic testing, as well as um, space learning, which is the a concept where the learning is spaced over time as opposed to blocked at, at one small window of time. And this is essential for long-term retention. Um, space retrieval in our platform is extremely intuitive. As I've mentioned before, questions will automatically pop up um, at the end of each of our video. And this is applicable as well to any videos that, that teachers from um, UM upload into the UM platform. Um, you know, you can input questions that pop up afterwards and use this data, data to, again, adjust whether your students have understood a certain concept and adjust your lessons afterwards. Um, and these questions will, will be returned to the students depending on their confidence level and depending on how many times they've gotten them right, so that it is returned at optimal intervals, allowing the students to, again, refresh their knowledge on the subject and watch the videos directly from the space retrieval window, which I will show after this. Um, and space retrieval is backed by a plethora of evidence, one of which is this paper by Dobson, who found a 41% better retention of information and less forgetting in groups given retrieval assessment um, compared to those without. Um, you know, so this is the illustration of the research, but you know, again, it shows very clearly that there is a significant um, improvement in retention and, and uh, reduction in forgetting. Uh, and the third one that, that students and teachers can try to implement through our platform is interleaving, which is the practice of mixing different related subject or topics when, when learning. Um, you know, it, is, uh, it promotes cognition and retention. It imparts contextual interference between topics which lead to um, a more cognitive effort and desirable difficulty, um, desirable difficulty in, in amongst learners. It promotes the compare and contrast mechanism in learners, and it boosts boosts inductive category learning and later transfer. Um, you know, and how they can apply it is actually by learning multiple concepts. And this is uniquely possible with Lecturio because of the fact that the entire medical curriculum is available to a student and to an educator at any given time. So vertical curricular integration, um, which is you know, a, a mix on the Flexnerian um, narrative of, of preclinical and clinical medicine is infinitely applicable with our platform. Uh, they can then relate concepts that they've learned in the previous session with the new concepts that they've learned. Um, they can mix the orders of flashcards and questions that they're practicing. And um, by paying attention to subsequent lessons with related topics, they will make use of the psychological, um, uh, psychological mechanisms that makes interleaving such an effective and well-trusted topic. 
Um, you know, the evidence behind it, again, there are ple- there's, there's a plethora of evidence, but I'm going to outline one by Hatam et al. Uh, in 2003, who showed the benefit of mixing contrastive topics over similar topics in the context of ECG interpretation. So students who were given uh, or who practice interpreting ECGs in a non-linear order who, uh, that are not grouped based on a particular diagnosis performed better in a subsequent test compared to students who were given or, or who practiced ECG reading um, in a sequential manner. So only STEMI ECGs for, for a time and then end STEMI ECGs. And then, um, uh, and, for example, Wolf Parkinson syndrome ECGs um, and so this makes the case that mixing different concepts or mixing the practice of different concepts that are related to each other, but sufficiently different to impart desirable difficulty is actually better than just grouping them together. And this is, again, possible with the curio, not just in practice, but also in learning. So, uh, I mean, these three videos um, are, you know, it's obviously related, the anatomy of the heart, hypovolemic shock, and physiology of the uh, circulatory system, Um, but they are from different um, disciplines, you know, in the horizontal um, curriculum, in the horizontal integration curriculum, you would not learn this at the same time. But with Lecturio, um, you, you know, you can apply the vertical integration very easily. Students can learn about the anatomy of the heart, link it with their, you know, with the understanding of how blood flows, um, how the MAP is calculated, uh, what constitutes a, peri- a peripheral pressure. Um, and, you know, they can also then connect it with the knowledge of what happens in hypovolemia and hypovolemic shock in emergency medicine, you know, what kind of interventions they need to make and what kind of physiological system, oh, underpinnings um, are happening in hypovolemia. Um, so yeah, that's an idea of interleaving. And we have a lot of different ways on how you can use this. And I'm, I'm more than happy to provide um, separate sessions on how exactly things can be applied with Luxurio. But as the time is very limited, I'm going to go and jump to this next one, next application as well. So the question bank, while not a direct application of interleaving and not a, a not a you know directly um, visible application of interleaving, it also um, make use of the principles of interleaving by allowing students to mix different questions. Um, from different um, materials in the same test practice. Um, And the feedback that is given uh, directly after strengthens the testing effect that exists already in the question banks and allows the students, again, to review and to link and to form connections between the different concepts that they are learning, strengthening their learning beyond what they would be able to do only with one, one concept at a time. So I'm going to go ahead and, um, you know, switch to another tab. I'm going to share my screen to show exactly how teachers can use it. Um, and, you know, this uh, the this is the home page. I think um, all of you knows it, uh, know it. Um, I want to show a bit the, vi- uh, the video library. I think um, I hope all the educators are familiar with the video layout. I've already shown you how the video looks like, so I'm not going to go through that. I'm going to jump and focus more on... Um, the administrative side of it. But before I do, um, I'll run through really quickly on the student side of things, what the students see, what they can use. Um, They can go through the preclinical and clinical um, video libraries, as well as other things that are, that have been grouped. The contents are mostly the same. However, um, they have been grouped in a way that is optimal for this current, um, you know, curricular distribution, and they can be filtered based on subject or organ system. I like subject E better because it is more familiar distribution. And we have, um, as you can see here in the preclinical um, anatomy, histology, physiology, um, including physical examination videos as well. You know, with the physical examination videos, we include a trial patient, an educator in a clinical setting, showing how, you know, different examinations are done um, and um, allowing students to stimulate uh, or simulate a, a skills lab uh, an environment within our platform. Um, and the anatomy, for example, as I've mentioned here, is distributed very clearly in subsystems. The upper limb anatomy is long and it's, um, it's not a short course. However, it does 
um, sp uh, split it into smaller chunks to make sure that students are always at an optimal point, uh, optimal level of concentration when they're watching a particular videos. And the video um, looks like this. As I mentioned, we, we pay very close attention to the composition of slides. Um, we have an educator on screen to make sure attention is um, as good as it can be, um, that students don't feel disconnected with what they're watching. Um, they have an, a 3D anatomic model that they can use during class and also on their own um, during your, your session. So you can use this to teach your classes. You can use this to, um, you know, ask your students to run through different levels in a, in a particular video and explore them, hide certain structures, name them before labeling it and showing what the structures are. Um, and as educators, you're also able to download the materials. Um, and these materials then can be used for you to teach your own classes, for you to take illustration out of them, summaries that we've created. Um, and these is, this is all possible because of the partnership that we've established with the University of Malaya. Um, and, and yeah, I think um, that's the very quick run through of the function of the student side of things they can obviously see the the tasks that you assign the videos that you assign in the study planner which is a really good planning tool for them um, they can create exam bundles for themselves use the exam bundles that we've created or do the test exams that you have uh, that you have created for them um, and they can space retrieve the things that they have watched um, and review the things that they um, have previously answered and have now, for example, as I do, as I did, answered incorrectly and watch the related videos directly there. Um, so Welcome. our focus is again allowing students to retrieve, allowing students to practice, and continue um, and um, create an environment where they can independently expose themselves multiple times to materials that they have not understand understood yet, or um, that they um, are unable uh, that they already understood before but uh, need to maintain. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and show you also one more function that I think can be useful uh, are patient notes, where students can input, um, you know, patient findings, uh, essentially creating their own medical record for you then as educators to review and talk about perhaps in tutorial classes. Um, and in, admin in the administration side uh, of things, um, I think the previous session has been done um, but you as an educator will be able to use this data um, as much as you want. For example, by dividing it uh, here, it's divided based on groups. You can see um, per group, which students have done which, uh, how many videos, which students have, have done which, um, or how many questions and how many of them have gotten things right or wrong. And with the insights dashboard functionality, you'll also be able to, um, You'll also be able to use, um, you know, our system to organize the data that that we have accumulated, um, that we have accumulated, and filter them based on the things that you need. Uh, that you need. So, you, for example, this is an overview. You can filter it uh, by performance, by course, so upper limb anatomy. How many minutes in total your all your students have watched? Um, how many of them uh, got things correctly? How many of things? How many of them got things um, incorrectly, and this can, can help you to, you know, focus your next session on the things that students are not managing well enough. So, for example, um, things like here, um, electrocardiogram interpretation, or um, so on and so forth. And you can also mix them based on group. Only see the anesthesiology classes. Only see um, the biomed classes. Um, and again, subsequently, for example, anesthesiology, see only curricula, um, um, see only a specific topic that you are teaching, um, et cetera. So it's a very, very, again, adaptable and um, you know, scalable system used only depending on what you need. Um, assignments, you can track your assignments for your students by, um, you know, you can attach, for example, this is Dr. Kong has um, uh, assigned a content, an uh, eight hour of content to, the, to, the, to, the, to his students. Um, and the status is that it has been completed, but you can also see how many users have done it, how many users have not done it and remind them 
right here uh, inside the platform so that you don't have you know to text them or you don't have to come to class the next time and find out that most of your students haven't watched the content that you've assi assigned, for example. I can also create assignment by assigning our videos, your videos, or a combination of the two. Again, it can you can assign eight hours of video, you can assign just five minutes, anything that you need, you can do inside our platform. Um, and you can also create tests. I think this is one of the last things that I wanna show you. You can create tests on our platform that can be performed both inside our um, that both inside our uh, window and outside of it. So in the Safe Exam browser system, for example, um, because I've just shown you an anatomy video, I want to show you maybe how we can look through things. Um, yep, that is correct. Um, and again, I'm leaving this up to um, you to choose which platform you'd like to use, but um, you know, to know that there's an option here for you to run through different questions, um, preview them before assigning them, and then um, you know, using our platform also to set um, it either as a summative test or as a um, as a formative test. Um, if the summative test is uh, if the test is a formative one, you can turn on tutor mode for your students to know the answers after they after they answer the question, or you can use it as an exam mode where they can where you can set time limits, where you can set when they can start, when they can stop, um, and bring it out in the safe exam browser environment. Um, so I think I'm nearing the end of my presentation here. Um, as admin, I would like to also let you know that you will be able to group students. So for example, if you have 100 students in your class and you have um, identified 10 struggling students, you'll, you're, you, you will be, you know, you will be, you can easily create groups of this 10 student and assign content specifically to them um, so that you don't, you know, you can keep track of these 10 students more closely, how many videos they've watched and how many answers they're getting, they're getting right and they're getting wrong. And it's very useful, for example, for summer classes, remedial classes, or elective courses that may not be, you know, that may be seasonal and not be constant, um, that, may be in, that may not be a constant fixture in your learning. And the patient knows that their student creates, for example, as a requirement for uh, graduation from our clinical rotation can, can be printed, can be reviewed by you as a teacher and can be um, filtered based on the groups that you've created or um, per name of the students. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna go and go back to the home screen now and answer the questions that are um, provided to me. So depending on the package, I think UM is able also have course creator access. You, you will be able, uh, Professor, to um, create questions for, or and, and upload questions from your from the University Malay of Malaya Question Bank yourself. And when you're uploading question, you'll also be able to write the feedback. So um, if question A is right, if question B, C, D is wrong, and why these things are right and why these things are wrong, and link it to the relevant con our content or your content that you feel is relevant for a student to review afterwards. It's a huge amount of task, but uh, Luxure is more than happy to also support you with this and run you through how this can be done um, outside of this session. Um, and answering Dr. Mohash, uh, Mohazmi, uh, beside preclinical videos, uh, is there any ready videos on teaching family medicine topics? So I would say yes. Um, I think, again, it's very scalable. Um, the family medicine in, may not be, you know, directly applicable, but we do have family medicine inside our window here. Um, you know, preventive medicine, for example, uh, prenatal breast cancer. It's something that, you know, a GP would need in a primary healthcare setting. However, it is not, you know, you wouldn't have the um, relevant content, for example, on how a Malaysian doctor will uh, can review projects uh, inside a, a primary healthcare center or um, ensure quality of care in a primary healthcare center. This is something that, uh, you know, clin um, local context that will need to be provided by um by educators, a, and there are questions, I think, um, questions made for us, but negotiate through the lectures. Okay, I and I've, I've, sorry, oh, Satria, you have answered it. I've answered it, yes. Thank right. you very much then for I your think, presentation. I've, I've, yeah, 
That's it. Thank you, Prof. Jamuna. And uh, did you want? Sorry, to... did I did I did I interrupt? Did you want to say something? Uh, no, just just a really quick clo uh, closing statement. Um, I think I I'm just going to jump back to my presentation. The uh, UM also already has a mobile app. So any content that you upload, any questions that you upload, any assignments that you provide to students will appear also on these mobile apps. So this is a good way, uh, I think, if you can encourage your students um, to have better uptake for them to study on the go, to have this portable University of Malaya library inside their pocket anytime they, anywhere, anytime, um, and, and you know promote asynchronous learning. Um, for your students. Um, and yeah, so I think that is it. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now and hand the floor back to Prof. Jamuna. Again, thank you so much for the welcome and open to any questions you may have. Uh, my email um, I will put in the chat. If you have any questions, um, I will be more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Satria. Um, there is a link that we have posted on the chat box, uh, which uh, will uh, you can put in your questions and we will pass it to Lecturio to actually answer those questions. Um, in the meantime, we will organize onboarding sessions once again with um, Lecturio for all academic staff as well as the postgraduate students. Um, and we will try to make this as uh, routine as possible so that, you know, we can actually get uh, people to come in and uh, join in eventually with the whole solution. At the moment, we have subscribed for five years. So we hope that there will be better take up by the faculty. Um, and faculty actually introduces Lecturio to the students. One other thing is, if you have a curriculum, Lecturio can map your learning outcomes to the content that they have, so that that is actually made available for your particular program. So if you need to um, get all these sort of uh, services provided, then please contact uh, Murdu. Uh, you can uh, contact Kuhan Krishnan at Murdu, and he will be able to help all of you to set the teaching materials that you would need for your program. In addition, there is a question bank, but this may be more for undergraduate level. Um, but you can also add on questions. And if you want to put any of your materials online, we can also facilitate that. So thank you very much, everyone, for patiently sitting through this despite uh, uh, running late. We hope that you will engage with Lecturio and uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, on the platform. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you, Satria, and thank you, Lecturio. You're very welcome and have a great day, everyone. Yeah, have a great day, everyone. Stay safe.